What's going on everybody? Once again, Mohawk Matt, bringing you some fantastic humans across the Department of the Navy and the Marine Corps that are science and technology wizards, which I'm grateful for because I am not. So we definitely need them. Today I have got Dr. Lee McHugh. How are you doing, Lee? Good, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Super excited to have you on today. Happy to be here. Excellent. Lee is uh, associate professor at George Mason University and a naval researcher. And I will totally slaughter it if I try to tell you what she actually does. So I'm going to pass it to her. Lee, what is it that you do as a professor or as a researcher? Yeah, so my area of expertise is ship dynamics. Okay. So kind of a classic example of that, do you sail? Uh, I've been on a sailboat. I don't, I don't call myself a sailor. Did you, have you ever capsized a sailboat? Yes. Yeah, so like I, I do work that tries to predict when boats will capsize. Wow. Um, so another application a lot of people often know is, like, do you kayak at all? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not good, but have you been in one? Have you ocean kayaked or bay kayaked? Yes. And so when you're trying to come in at the end of the day, you try to like ride a wave in, right? Uh huh. And what happens when you try to ride a wave in, but you're not that good a kayaker? You get sent back out. You either get sent back out or you like kind of catch the wave and then like you get turned sideways really quickly and you get dunked. Yeah. So that's called broaching and that's another ship dynamics right. that, phenomenon. That's usually just where I live. I just, yeah. stay, I just stay in the water because I'm going to fall over anyway. I, I'm the same way with kayaking. So very cool. So ship dynamics. So it's kind of keeping the ship afloat. Exactly. Fantastic. Afloat and upright. And upright. And at George Mason University, you're a professor of? Mechanical engineering. Do you like that? I do. I like it quite a bit. So what is... How did you get where you are? Were, were you, Lee, as a five-year-old, like, I'm going to be a professor at George Mason? No. So my undergrad, I went to school, or I went to college thinking that I was going to major in physics. I was always good at math and, and science-y things. And okay. um, I, I'll date myself, but I really wanted to be Jodie Foster in contact. Like, that's, that's where right. I wanted to go with my life. Um, I got to college though, and my college roommate was a mechanical engineering major, and her classes looked like more fun than mine. Ah. Um, and around the same time, my aunt actually married a pilot, and so he was taking me to things like the Oshkosh Air Show and stuff, and I was getting to see planes up close more and more, and I thought, this is pretty cool. Wow. Engineering sounds great. So I found myself over in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering instead. Okay. And then I went to grad school for aerospace engineering, and actually saw a talk by a Carterock recruiter while I was in grad school. Carterock is a naval facility. Is a naval facility, exactly. Um, saw this talk by a Carterock recruiter and went up to him afterwards and said, this is really cool, how do I learn more about it? And they said, well, you're actually at one of the few schools, I was at Michigan for grad school. Okay. Said, you're at one of the few schools that has a naval engineering program, you should go across the street to that department and take yes. some of their classes. So the next thing I knew, I was a grad student in naval architecture and marine engineering. Fantastic. And how did, how did you get associated to Navy and the Marine Corps? You kind of went to the ships, but was it like, hey, here's a recruiter. Hey, I want to be a Navy researcher. Yeah, so I found my way over to the, that Naval Architecture Department, and one of the first classes I went to was taught by Armin Trosch, who okay. does quite a bit of Navy-supported, ONR-supported research okay. um, in ship dynamics. And he kind of took me under his wing, became my PhD mentor and advisor. Yeah, it started introducing me to the problems related to ship dynamics, and I just thought they were really cool. They kind of scratched that itch I had for enjoying math and physics-y problems. Um, but physics-y, also, that's a science-y word. It's a science-y physics word. Physics-y, that's official, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, right. Um, it, with a good real-world application, which is what I like. Fantastic. So when, how long have you been teaching at George Mason? Only been at Mason for a couple years. So after okay. after grad school, um, which I should note, actually, I ended up having funding from the Navy in order to go to grad school. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, so the NDSEG program, great program. Uh, which is? The National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship Program. A lot of words. Is what it stands for, It sounds yes. like it's a great program. It is a great program. It paid for my grad school, was tremendously grateful for it. Fantastic. Um, so that also got me kind of into the Navy family. So, Lee, where are we now? Whether you're as a professor, as the research you're doing for the Navy, what is it the Navy and Marine Corps is up to? What are you looking at in ship dynamics and things like that? So what I'm really excited about these days is autonomous systems. Okay. So more and more the world is moving to this. If you're watching this video, it's a good chance you've got an RC something at home that you fly around and, and enjoy tinkering with. Um, with Navy and Marine Corps work, we're looking at, at things as small as that and, and then scaling up to really large sizes. And from the dynamics perspective, part of why that's really, really cool is it totally changes the game in terms of how we use those devices with, with other assets. Mm -hmm. So as an example, 
um, helicopters landing on ships like have a pretty prescribed way that they do it. Yes. And you want the helicopter to land upright, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got a person in it and helicopters fly one way. Yeah, it's important. It's important. But so when you start talking about autonomous systems, that whole paradigm kind of goes out the window. Um, Scan Eagle is a project that I think the Navy and Marine Corps use quite a bit of. Um, that its recovery mechanism is it basically flies into a line that's attached to the ship. So it does sort of this controlled crash, yeah. which is really cool. Um, so you can start thinking about things of, well, why do we need to have a deck that we land on? Why don't we just have it land on the side of the deck house or land in whatever weird position kind of like is a most bird convenient. coming onto a cliff, just kind of hanging there. Exactly. And so if you can predict the motions of the ship, it makes those sorts of things work that much better. So a company in the autonomous side kind of comes to that predictability. Exactly. Exactly. And I really like those interface problems. My background is this big old mix of mechanical and aerospace and naval engineering. Mm -hmm. And so I love problems that get to mix those up. And are you, so when you're teaching at George Mason, are you like, hey, I'm that, you, you're going to be in ship dynamics one day. Or is that something that's attractive to students? Or is it something that people don't even know exists? Like, I didn't know it was a thing until we met 12 minutes ago. Yeah, I think that it does attract students. Um, I've had undergraduate researchers blowing things up underwater in my lab. So, you know, it's hard not to find that. Who problem. doesn't love that? Yeah, right. that's great. <laughs> um, I've got an undergrad researcher right now who's been working just on converting RC boats to autonomous operation. So it's kind of okay. a fun, hands-on, lots of Arduino and Raspberry Pi and like the things that a lot of people are playing with anyways with yeah. a good purpose behind it. So earlier we kind of talked about like how the, uh, um, like a kayak, kind of a kayak capsizing, and you talk autonomously, you're talking robotic technology or on its own. Could you ever see the technology go where something capsizes and it on, on by itself? Yes. Yeah, Uncapsizes, so, if that's the right word. Yeah, so the Coast Guard runs self riding boats. Okay. Um, and, and so the notion that you would do that for autonomous vessels would make a lot of sense. And that's actually another thing that's really interesting right now in the ship design world is when you look at unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned underwater vehicles, yes. they really have been optimized for running unmanned. But a lot of the unmanned surface vehicles are basically boats or ships that already exist that are kind of converted over. So they're not really optimized yet from the design standpoint okay. for, for getting the most out of this autonomous operation. Okay. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of really interesting things that we can start to do with that, like not caring which way is up and, and just having it Go run and forward. go forward, exactly. Or and backward. Or backward, whatever direction you need to <laughs> <Right>. go. Right. <laughs> That's excellent. Where do you think this is going? Like 20 years, where do, you, if, do you have any insights to what you see is going on, either as the Navy and Marine Corps or the technology in general? I think that there's so many different, really interesting aspects to this. Um, if I can talk to a NASA application. Please. So I had a NASA project a few years back where we were looking at how you would do under ice exploration on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, which is a very similar sort of problem as what we're talking about with autonomous vessels on Earth. Yes. It's, we called it our interplanetary flying dolphin is sort of our nickname okay, for it. Okay, I like it. Because <laughs> once you get under the ice of Europa, everything else is very much like what we're trying to do here. You know, you're going and trying to seek out interesting phenomena. There, it's things that might indicate life. Here, it's whatever it is that you want to be sniffing out. Sure. Um, and then the communications infrastructure to get that information back becomes really interesting of how do you send a whole lot of data quickly to whoever needs to be processing it, whether you're trying to cross the solar system or just trying to get across the world. Fantastic. That's really cool. It's a really cool application to see things on other planets. We can use them here. Right. So, Lee, what's really unique about you is that you're actually not a government employee. That's correct. You're kind of funded for projects and research and things, but you're, you're a professor at a university, and you still get to do things with the military. How does that kind of work? Yeah, so it works in a lot of different ways. Um, I mentioned that the Navy paid for my grad school, mm -hmm. um, and so that is, was sort of my first entry point. Um, there's a number of different programs that the Navy have in order to bring people in, starting actually when they're in high school all the way through their faculty careers. That's incredible. Yeah, it really is. I've, I've seen high schoolers and college students doing amazing things. Again, Cardrock is the lab that I know best because um, that's who I've worked with the most. I spent a couple summers doing the visiting faculty program that they have. Um, twice working with their sea keeping and hydrodynamics kind of people, once working with their ship, de ship design folks. Um, and then I actually did a sabbatical year, so a full academic year, I was working with the combatant craft division. So they do okay. high speed, go fast, cool kind of boats. 
cool is always cool. Cool is always cool. That, that's interesting. And what's really awesome about that, folks, is that could be you. If you're in college right now, you don't have, like, I don't want, maybe government employees not the route I want to go, and that's okay. Lee here's the perfect example of that. So you're doing great work with the David and Marine Corps, but you're still doing other things that you wanted to continue to do through some of those great programs that you mentioned. Yeah. So Lee, a little birdie told me that you kind of been doing some app development, and we all have apps on our phones. Right. So what have you been working on? Yeah, so I've been able to channel some of the work that we've done in terms of predicting ship motions into doing app-based mo motion predictions. Okay. So it's a nice example of transitioning research that could be equally applicable to somebody operating on a you know, small, go-fast naval vessel or a destroyer or a container ship or a commercial, commercial fishing boat. Okay. Um, so I've got an app. It's called Scramp. It's free in the App Store. Scramp small, stands for Small Craft Motion Program. Okay. Uh, it is free in the App Store. I promise I'm not trying to sell you a 99 cent, you know, something. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it gives, it gives a fisherman or whoever wants to use it a sense of what's going on with their boat. And it can help identify if somebody might be getting motion sick. It can help identify if they're in a dangerous state with their motions. It can help identify uh, parametric roll, which is actually a really interesting phenomena. It's a roll pitch coupling that's kind of unintuitive. So like roll is when you're going this way, pitch is when you're going this way. Uh -huh. So normally if waves are really bad, people naturally want to point directly into the waves to keep from rolling a bunch. Sure. So this thing called parametric roll is a coupling between the two where you point right into the waves and it starts making you roll this way. Um, it was identified as possible back in the 60s. A guy named Randy Pauling uh, identified that it could happen, but nobody really paid it much attention until the APL China incident happened where it was a post Panamax container ship. It's a huge container ship uh, going from Asia to the west coast of the US, got caught in a fast moving storm. Okay. Captain did everything right, according to the book, pointed into the waves, slowed to maneuvering speed, and that was exactly what it took to excite this weird phenomena. Ended up losing $100 million in cargo over the side. Wow. So once you lose $100 million in cargo, people care about the problem a lot more. Yes. <laughs> um, and the math behind it is actually pretty straightforward. So it's the sort of thing that you can code up into an app on your phone and say to somebody, hey, I think parametric roll is going on. So like, even though this is really weird and counterintuitive, you need to do something different because you're in a dangerous situation. I think it's really cool that it's being addressed from like an app perspective because a lot of people have a phone in their pocket. And so you're not asking them to get this massive technology in this box you put on your ship or or whatnot, you just have whatever you already have on you and you're able to use it right then and there. Exactly. I think it also is a really good example of multidisciplinary research too, because okay. a lot of what I've done with that app, the first versions of what I did made sense in my head as an engineer. But as I started talking to fishermen and started talking to epidemiologists and started talking to people like throughout the professional sphere who understand how to do safety interventions like this, mm -hmm. it totally changed the product for the better. Okay. Um, and that diversity of perspectives, I think, is, is a key part of where research is going. So, Lee, you got this really cool opportunity to go on a sub twice. What was like the, one of the coolest things or something different that you're like you would never experience anywhere else? It was, I mean, it was just such a unique experience all around. I mean, the first time you meet the boat and the sun is coming up because you're going out early in the morning to meet them and it's just this beautiful sunrise and you see a submarine come like sort of creeping up in this really... Pretty awesome. <laughs> it's really fantastic. Um, you know, we got to do the photo opportunity where you're coming out at the top of the sub and you, know, you have the waves behind you and it's Excellent. all gorgeous. Uh, but probably what I enjoyed the most, the captain let us eat a meal with him and we were talking about food during our, our back and forth a little bit earlier, sure. but uh, the food is wonderful. But, but eating with the captain, there was a screen where he was watching um, just what was going on in the world around him. And I kind of was picking his brain of like, what are you looking at? And I found it really interesting just to try to get inside his head a little bit and okay. you know, what is interesting to the person who is commanding this vessel um, and how can that also help drive how we present information when we're trying to do things yeah. like motion predictions or whatever it is, whatever data we're trying to convey, how do you make it most effective it's and that social engineering side, you kind of get in their head to know what you need to plan for in the lab. Exactly. It's fantastic. Well, Lee, thank you for coming on. It's been fantastic talking to you and learning more about what you're involved in, in ship dynamics, and making sure my kayak doesn't tip over, or if it does, how do I get out of it, kind of stuff. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me here. You're so welcome. And we can't wait to hear what you think of 
the conversation we just had with Lee and kind of where you think we're going with kayaks tipping over or not tipping over or autonomous vehicles in the water and what you guys, what your thoughts are, where you think we are now and where you think we're going and what ideas maybe you have because the future really is up to you. So thanks everyone, appreciate it.